Good morning. Welcome to the King's Congregation and welcome to our visitors. If you don't mind, we actually have, for visitors, we have some contact cards on the back table or the QR code on the bulletin. Um, if you don't mind filling that out, we'd love to get in contact with you and also um, get you on the list to receive our weekly King's Chronicle that goes out with announcements, um, some of which I'll be giving you today. Directly after worship, we have our catechism classes. Uh, those are going to be for children all the way starting at three years old, all the way up through teenagers. So um, they're all on the north end of the building by the main lobby. You go up the stairs. And that's also the same area where we'll fellowship after worship. We have to clear this, this uh, auditorium here so that we can let another church come in. They start around 11 o'clock, so we need to be out of here by around 10:20. Um, and when you leave this this area, either go down through the hallway to the main lobby to fellowship, or try to go out the uh, southeast door, which is over here on my left. This week um, we have the Canyon County Men's Bible Study, which meets tomorrow morning at Casey Christopher's house. They're going to be starting the Psalms going through uh, Psalms 1 through 10. And also we have several other opportunities for Bible studies, uh, men's Bible study, men's book club, women's book club, women's prayer group. Um, if, you wanna, if you're interested in joining one of those, just grab myself, uh, one of the elders, one of the deacons after worship, or even somebody that's been here a while, probably knows what the schedule of those are. And finally, it is my pleasure to announce that Nick and Megan Montero are expecting their first child. And a double pleasure today, Corbin and Emily Kizar are expecting. This is the day our Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your, your hearts shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. Amen. Amen. Let us worship the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lift up your heart. O oh God, our Father, we are glad in your presence and rejoice before you. We extol you who rides upon the clouds. We sing praises to your name. You're a father of the fatherless, a defender of the widow and orphan. You set the solitary in families. You bring out those who are bound into prosperity. But the rebellious you set in a desert land. Through Christ Jesus you have gone out before your people. You have borne our sins and led us through the waters of death as on dry ground. You have defeated Satan and his army. You have given us your covenant of love and your holy word. You have carried us through the wilderness. You have given us bread from heaven and water from the everlasting rock. You have disciplined us with a father's loving hand and taught us that we live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. You have set the whole earth before us as the land of our inheritance. You have given us fields we did not sow, vineyards we did not plant, and cities we did not build. All the kingdoms and their glory you have set before us in Christ. And when the nations fume against us, you rise up and deliver us. You dwell in our midst. You are our temple. You are our sun. So arise, O God, and let your enemies be scattered, that all the kingdoms of the earth would join us in singing praises to you. We are your people, O God, and we worship you now, together with the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you above, and with the Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns in us. One God, only God, world without end. Amen. King's congregation, you've heard the call. God has assembled us. He's called us to worship him. It's our privilege to answer. So let's turn together in the bulletin to page three as we answer with his own words in our mouths, singing the words of Psalm 136, ever and a. I'm going to ask the men to sing verse one, the ladies to sing verse two, the men verse three, and so on until we all join together to sing verse 7 together. Ever and day, let's sing.
be seated. Preparing for a time of confession, I'd ask you to turn the page in the bulletin to page four. Lord, give us light, thy truth to see, and make us wise in knowing thee. We have not known thee as we ought. Let's sing together. gospel word this morning comes from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons... Take these things away, and do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. 
When God placed Adam in the garden, he gave him two main duties. He is told to work it and keep it, or better yet, to cultivate it and guard it. These are Adam's priestly duties, to cultivate God's holy space and to guard it from intruders that would pollute it. And this is precisely where Adam failed. In letting the serpent come in, deceive his bride, and twist God's word, he failed as a priest. And we know these are priestly duties because those two same words are used to describe the duties of the priests in the tabernacle and temple. And that's because the garden was a temple, and the temple was a glorified garden. When Jesus cleanses the temple, he's acting as a faithful priest. He understands this fundamental aspect of Adam's vocation, and he executes it faithfully. The money changers had turned what should have been a house of prayer for the nations into a for-profit business. John tells us when the disciples, when the disciples saw the tables turning and the whip of cords, they remembered a verse from Psalm 69. Zeal for your house will consume me. However, there's a change in tense. When David wrote Psalm 69, in verse 9 he writes, Zeal for your house has consumed me. John puts Jesus' consuming zeal in the future. Zeal for your house will consume me. And that's because while Jesus was zealous for the physical temple, as we just read, it was nothing compared to his zeal to be consumed for the living temple yet to be built by his blood. Throughout his ministry, Jesus has his face resolutely set towards Jerusalem, and he knows exactly what awaits him there, and nothing will stop him. When he tells his disciples that he must be killed, they understandably try to prevent it, but he rebukes them because he is consumed with zeal, zeal to be consumed for them. If you want to know what is in his heart as, be, as he is being consumed on the cross, just read the rest of Psalm 69. Verse 1, the waters have come up to my neck. I have come to deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with crying out. My throat is parched, and my eyes grow dim. And why was he consumed? Well, the second half of the, of the verse that John quotes tells us, Zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who have reproached you have fallen on me. And yet, even as he was drowning in our sin, he remains full of faith. Verse 16 of Psalm 69, answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. And as he approaches his final breath, he knows how his father will respond. These are the words that we were called to worship with. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. As we come to confess our sins, we need to keep in mind that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you think that he is less zealous for his father's house now than he was then, you would be badly mistaken. This is the man who stands right now as our great high priest, cultivating and guarding his people with glorified wounds of zeal that our reproaches brought upon him, pleading our pardon and righteousness to his father. And even more, because he is ours, everything he has belongs to us, including his zeal. The Lord Jesus himself tells the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. He forgives us and cleanses us to make us zealous for his people, zealous for good works, as Paul tells Titus, and zealous for righteousness. We have seen it, and we have been made glad. So as you stand to hear the great news of your forgiveness through Christ, let your hearts revive. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Let us go now before the Lord, having his promise to forgive us through Christ. If you're able to do so comfortably, please kneel. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have left undone and by what we have done. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We confess our individual sins to you now privately. Father, in your mercy, forgive what we have been, transform what we are, carry us forward and direct what we shall be, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Please stand for the assurance of pardon. Jesus himself said that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in Jesus is the one who is not condemned. You have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who bore the sins of the world. In faith you have confessed your sins to God who so loved the world that he gave his son, his only begotten son, that you would not perish but have everlasting life. And so I tell you to be at peace and rejoice because your sins are forgiven in Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the great light of that assurance that I ask you to turn in the treasury to number 25, a familiar setting of Psalm 9, O Lord Most High. Let's sing together.
Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 83. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people, and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a co confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Jabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot, Selah. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin and the brook of Kishon, at the brook of Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb. Yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zul Zulmuna, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for our possession. O oh my God, make them like the whir whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind. As the fire burns the woods, and as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest, and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. The word of the Lord. Be to God. And our New Testament reading this morning will come from Acts 5. We'll be reading verses 12 through 16. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Please stand together and turn in the treasury to number 508. Raise our voices together. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Let's sing.
right, join me in prayer for Christ's kingdom and the local body. Father in heaven, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is within them. You have filled us with your spirit and called us to put our trust in you. We have come into your presence. We collectively put our trust in you and we know that you are faithful to hear our prayers and petitions today in the name of Jesus Christ. We are thankful today for the freedom to worship you publicly in our nation. We pray for those in your kingdom who do not share those same freedoms. Give your people courage and protection as they gather together to worship you, O God. We pray that the leaders of our nation and all the nations of the earth would recognize Christ's authority over all of life. He sits in the throne as King of Kings. Heavenly Father, we pray for the prosperity of King's Congregation Church. We pray that you would continually sow peace and unity amongst our body. We pray that our relationships would be meaningful and transparent. Help, our, help the leaders of our church uh, to be faithful to your scriptures and to remain above reproach. We ask that you would give us all a hunger for studying your word so that we might be able to guide and protect one another. Please give us a passion for our community here in Idaho and the wisdom and courage to proclaim your gospel throughout the Treasure Valley. Dear Lord, we thank you for each of the households here at Kings, large and small. I pray that our homes would be a picture of your love and mercy. We thank you for our children and that your covenant promises are upon them. I pray that you would give each of them the grace to put their trust in you as they continue to grow in wisdom and stature. We pray for the mothers in our congregation who are expecting that you would give them safe pregnancies and deliveries. I also pray that you would extend your merciful hand and bring back the lost sheep from amongst us and strengthen those who may be wavering in their faith. Lord, you are our provider, so we ask for financial provision for the members of our church for those in our congregation who are looking for their long-term calling and vocation, I pray that you would bring them rewarding opportunities. As you bless our finances, I also ask that you would help us to be faithful, willing, and cheerful givers so that we might be a blessing to the church and to others in need. Father, for the sick amongst us and amongst our friends and family, we ask for your mercy and healing, comfort, and recovery. We also ask that they would be strengthened in their sickness, that through their sickness, their trust in you would increase and that you would glorify yourself in their time of need. We bring all these prayers and petitions before your throne in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please stand together and turn in the treasury to number 429. We have a new song of the month for our new month. Psalm 117 was our song of the month for February. For March, it'll be Psalm 134. We're learning these so that you can bring them into your parish groups and sing together some simple songs. Your kids might know them better than you do. So we encourage that. That's a good thing. Some instructions. Um, we're going to sing this in three groups. We're going to sing it once all together, and then we're going to sing it once as a round, our three groups are as follows, sopranos and kids are group one, altos and tenors, group two, basses, group three. When you get to the last phrase, you can just keep repeating that until we're all in unison together at the end. Behold, bless the Lord. Let's sing together.
Amen. Please be seated. This morning in the, our study of Genesis, we will be looking at Genesis chapter 40 from verse 1 all the way to Genesis 41 and verse 46. This is one of the longer passages that we have looked at, but it all hangs together, and so we want to consider it together. So let's sit back and enjoy these wonderful events that God brought to pass in his perfect providence some 4,000 years ago. These are the words of God. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and chief baker. So he put them in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them. And he served them, so they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them. Each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came in to them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. And also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream and there were three white baskets on my head. And the uppermost baskets were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. And the birds ate them out of the basket of my head. So Joseph answered and said, <clears throat> This is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat your flesh from you. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among the servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river, Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, 
but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he had interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river looking fine and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. And when they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke, also in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them, and the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh that he, what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of the good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your counsel, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah and he gave him as a wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. 
So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Our great God and Father, we pray that you would open to us all the wisdom and glory and riches that are contained in these events you brought to pass in your perfect providence, that we might be your faithful servants in our own day, that we might follow in the footsteps of Joseph. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is through a series of dreams given to unbelievers that God finally exalts Joseph in fulfillment of the dreams that he gave to him 13 years before at age 17. Joseph's dreams were of great exaltation, and yet they resulted in humiliation, immediate and prolonged. For 13 years, Joseph is humbled and afflicted, captured by his brothers and sold to Ishmaelite traders, sold again as a slave in Egypt, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. And yet in every affliction, Joseph has continued to trust and serve God. He has continued to believe the promises God gave him in those dreams. He has continued to serve whomever God has placed over him. He has continued to bless those over him in a way that is so remarkable that it can only be ascribed to the living God. But now through these new dreams that God has given to pagan unbelievers, first to the imprisoned butler and baker of Pharaoh, and then to Pharaoh himself, God will now finally bring Joseph out of prison and exalt him to Pharaoh's right hand with all authority over Egypt. And as we will see going forward over the surrounding lands and peoples as well, for all of them will be under the famine. And all will come to Egypt and bow down before Joseph and receive from him what was in those circumstances quite literally the bread of life. And so we see what a vivid picture of Christ Joseph was. And we see how much care God took to preach the gospel, not only to his covenant people, but also to the Gentiles. So let's look at the details of this remarkable story. The ramp up to Joseph's exaltation begins when the king's butler and baker are committed to the captain of the guard to keep them in custody until the king decides their fate, life or death, because each of them has offended the king in some way. And the king literally holds the power of life and death over them. The word for butler is more accurately rendered chief cupbearer. And we see his essential duties in verses 11 and 21. He's the one who filled Pharaoh's cup with wine. But a chief cupbearer did a lot more than that. Chief cupbearers would also be charged with personally tasting the king's wine, not only to ensure its quality, but also to ensure the absence of poison. So the chief cupbearer was one whom the king trusted with his life. The chief cupbearer would also be present during important meetings between the king and his advisors, between the king and nobles of his own kingdom, between the king and visitors from other lands. You see an example of that in chapter 41, verses 8 through 11, when the chief cupbearer is present during Pharaoh's meetings with his magicians and wise men. The, the cupbearer is there to hear what's going on. He's also there to speak directly to Pharaoh regarding Joseph. So the chief cupbearer was also a confidant and an important advisor to the king. If you want another example of this in Scripture, look at Nehemiah, who held the position of chief cupbearer for the king of Persia in Nehemiah chapters 1 and 2. Now the word for baker indicates that he was the chief baker. He was in charge of all the baked breads and pastries and delicacies. There's an Egyptian dictionary for ancient 
Egypt, which lists 38 kinds of cake and 57 varieties of bread. We don't know as many details about this position as we do about chief cupbearer. We don't know for sure if he would enjoy the same kind of a critical advisor role as the chief cupbearer. But without question, this was another high official of the king. Both of these men were counted on by the king in a way that put them in the king's presence a lot. And thus, it gave them the opportunity to impress the king, to make him proud, to receive great favor from him. But it also gave them the opportunity to disappoint the king, to embarrass the king, to offend the king in some way so that their life would literally be placed on the line. Both of these men are placed in the custody of the captain of the guard. Now, we've already learned back in chapter 39, verse 1, that the captain of the guard is Potiphar, who first bought Joseph when he was brought to Egypt. And so Potiphar has to take custody of these two officials, and they don't go to the normal prison. They go to the private prison that's the house of the captain of the guard, and they are entrusted by Potiphar to Joseph, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 40. And it seems that Potiphar here, as captain of the guard, is intentionally placing Joseph in a position where he can make an impression on these men and hopefully come to Pharaoh's attention, find favor in his eyes, and obtain his freedom. You can see that's exactly what Joseph is hoping for, for he asked the chief cupbearer, When you are restored to your position, remember me to Pharaoh. He's hoping he can be released, verse 14. And he makes his case to the chief cupbearer. He's done nothing to deserve this fate. He was kidnapped. That's what stolen away means in verse 15. He was kidnapped. He's talking about his brothers. And he had done nothing to be thrown into prison because he was falsely accused. So all along... He has been the same wise and faithful servant that the cupbearer has come to know. That's his point. Verse 15. Now what lies behind all of this is the fact that the only way for freedom for Joseph is if Pharaoh sets him free. Any other means to freedom will be a death warrant for Joseph. Because you have to remember, Joseph was accused by Potiphar's wife, a woman from a very prominent Egyptian family who had her own contingent of servants within Potiphar's house. She accused Joseph, a foreigner and a slave, of assaulting and attempting to rape her in her own house. She had his garment in her hand, and all of the servants were on her side The punishment under those conditions is certain death. The only way Potiphar has been able to spare Joseph's life is putting him in the private royal prison that Potiphar himself oversees as captain of Pharaoh's guard. It may well be the case that Potiphar's wife and her family believe that Joseph has been put to death. They may not even realize that he's still alive. So for Joseph to be released by anyone other than Pharaoh is a death sentence. He is either going to be released by Pharaoh or he will stay there the rest of his life. Now given that situation, we see that it's in the perfect providence of God that the chief cupbearer and chief baker are placed in Potiphar's private prison with Joseph personally serving them, and then each of them having a dream the same night, which they immediately sense are of divine origin and portend of the future, telling them their fate. But both of them are helpless to discern the meaning of their dreams. So they are dejected, which Joseph notices and asks them why. They explain about their dreams and how they have no interpreter. Now, the Egyptians were all into dreams, and they definitely reviewed, they viewed certain types of dreams, ones like the cupbearer and baker had, as definite omens of the future. And they had a whole class of priests 
you might call them diviner priests, who were trained in dream interpretation. You will see these diviner priests referred to in chapter 41 as magicians and wise men. But the cupbearer and the baker have no ac uh, access to these priests in prison. And, as we will see more importantly, the dreams God has given lie beyond the ability of those priests to interpret in any event. So Joseph asked them to tell him their dreams while correcting their theology. He points the two men to God, who is the true giver and, and, and interpreter of prophetic dreams, verse 8. You see, it's not a matter of using secret arts to delve into the secret knowledge of the gods, which as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10.20, they are really demonic powers. It's a matter of the one true God, creator, sustainer, and governor of all things, giving revelation of his plans and his will. And then also giving revelation of the correct understanding of the same. As it says in Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So when Joseph gives the interpretation of their dreams, he relates exactly what God has revealed to him, which is why he gives the good news of the cupbearer's dream and the bad news of the baker's dream in exactly the same manner, verses 12 and 13 and 18 and 19. And the dreams are fulfilled precisely as Joseph has said. Exactly three days later, the heads of the cupbearer and the baker are both lifted up, but for opposite reasons. The cupbearer is restored to his high office, verse 21. But the baker is beheaded and hung, verse 22. That's the meaning of verse 19 when Joseph says, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you. That's decapitation and hang you on a tree. That's publicly displaying his body and decapitated head so that he is disgraced and the birds eat his flesh. Now, this particular treatment in the belief of the ancient Egyptians would prevent the baker's spirit from being able to rest in the afterlife. You see, this is why embalming was such a big deal to the ancient Egyptians. Preserving the body was very important and was necessary for entering into peace, rest, and blessing in the afterlife. So what happens to the baker was a very aggravated form of death penalty. But despite all of these amazing, miraculous events, the cupbearer forgets about Joseph completely. It is two full years later that he remembers Joseph. And it's only because Pharaoh has received a dream that none of his priests, the magicians and wise men, can interpret. Chapter 41, verses 1 through 8. Then the cupbearer remembers Joseph and tells Pharaoh of him while confessing his wrong and forgetting him. Verses 9 through 13. So com Pharaoh commands for Joseph to immediately be brought out of prison so the attendants of Pharaoh are hurriedly making Joseph presentable to the king. The Egyptian men of that day were typically clean shaven. So Joseph shaves. He receives a change of clothing suitable to an audience with the king. And the servants of Pharaoh are hurrying Joseph through all of this and literally running with him to the palace. That's the sense of the Hebrew because Pharaoh is waiting and he is not accustomed to waiting. And when they arrive, Pharaoh says that he has had a dream. He's speaking to Joseph. And he says, no one can interpret it. But he has heard, literally this is the way it reads, he has heard that, that Joseph can simply hear a dream and interpret it right away. That's the gist of verse 15. Joseph corrects Pharaoh immediately. This is the way the Hebrew reads. Not me. Not me, Joseph exclaims. God will give Pharaoh an answer completely. 
That's the way the Hebrew reads in verse 16. You see, the Hebrew word for peace can also be used to mean completeness. And that's the way it's used in verse 16. Joseph is not saying that God will give Pharaoh an answer that he likes, but that God will answer Pharaoh completely by giving him the meaning of the dream in detail. So Pharaoh recounts his dream to Joseph. The seven fat cows coming out of the Nile, followed by seven gaunt cows that eat them while remaining gaunt. And the seven full heads of grain, followed by the seven blighted ones that consume them while remaining blighted. Verses 17 through 24. Then Joseph gives God's revelation to Pharaoh. God is showing Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will be seven years of great plenty, followed by seven years of famine so severe that it will be as though the years of plenty never happened. And then God repeats the message in a second dream to drive home the fact that God's plans are sure, they're not changing, and they're imminent. They're about to happen right away. And God's revelation to Joseph also includes what Pharaoh should do about what's coming. Pharaoh should appoint a wise and capable man to supervise preparations, which should include storing up grain during the years of plenty so that relief will be available for the years of famine, lest the whole land be wiped out. So bottom line, you put it in a nutshell, What God is revealing to Pharaoh is that he is about to seriously shake things up so that Pharaoh and all the people understand two things, who's in charge and who can save because it's not Pharaoh and it's not any of his diviner priests and it's not any of the demonic powers they worship. They're not in charge. They're not in control, and they cannot save, neither from the storms of this life, from famine, much less from final judgment on the last day. The one who is in charge and who is the only one who can save is the one true and living God, the God of Joseph. Now, shaking things up like this To bring home these truths is one of the main ways of God in which he works his salvational and kingdom purposes in the earth. And we see this again and again in scripture. Think about the book of Daniel. God gives a dream. Not to Daniel, but to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And that dream concerns what God is about to do. But none of the wise men of Babylon can interpret the dream. So Nebuchadnezzar must turn to Daniel, to whom God reveals the meaning of the dream. Does this sound familiar? And what God is going to do, big picture, is shake things up in Babylon to drive home the same basic points he's making in our text in Genesis. Nebuchadnezzar, you are not in control. God, the God of Daniel, he is in control. And he is the only Savior, the only one who can deliver from the storms of life and final judgment on the last day. And the one true God is calling Nebuchadnezzar to acknowledge these truths, to worship the one true God, and to act in accordance with his will, which is the exact same thing God is calling Pharaoh to do in our text. So how do Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar respond to God's message? Well, Nebuchadnezzar responds initially in pride, and he has to be broken by God. Nebuchadnezzar starts out trying to co-opt God's kingdom purposes to his own ends and glory. And then Nebuchadnezzar continues to remain unrepentant until God takes away his sanity and makes him eat grass like an ox for seven years, Daniel chapter 4. But at the end of that time, God in mercy restores Nebuchadnezzar's sanity, 
And Nebuchadnezzar, a broken man, turns to God in faith and repentance. And he makes one of the greatest confessions of all scripture, a model for all rulers still today. Daniel 4.34 I, Nebuchadnezzar, bless the Most High and praise and honor Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. What about Pharaoh? Well, his immediate response is very different from Nebuchadnezzar's. And his immediate response, indeed, is a miracle of God's grace. Now, we say this because we know what a typical unbelieving Pharaoh looks like. We know that from the book of Exodus. The Pharaoh there, no matter how much God's word is given to him, no matter how many examples of God's sovereign power he sees, he gets harder and harder, such is the power of unbelief. But we see the opposite here with this Pharaoh. This Pharaoh immediately believes the revelation of God, immediately takes action in accordance with that revelation, and immediately exalts Joseph over everything he has, just like Potiphar did earlier, and for the same reason. Pharaoh sees that the Spirit of God is with Joseph. Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom is the Spirit of God? He asks, verse 38. That's why Pharaoh tells Joseph, no one is as discerning and wise as you. Why? Because God has shown Joseph all these things. It's God that makes the difference. It's not Joseph of himself. That's why Pharaoh exalts Joseph over all Egypt. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you, Pharaoh tells to Joseph in verse 40. In other words, Pharaoh is not abdicating his throne here, but he himself is going to submit to Joseph's wisdom and his plans of preparation for the famine. So Pharaoh immediately and formally invests Joseph with all the authority of what the Egyptians would have called the grand vizier, the one Pharaoh trusted to oversee everything in the kingdom except for Pharaoh himself. That's what the signet ring and the fine linen garments and the gold chain and the special chariot are all about in verses 42 and 43. They are formal tokens of Joseph's status over everything and everyone except for Pharaoh. That's also what the marriage to Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, is all about in verse 45. That marriage signifies that Joseph's exaltation is permanent. That's also what Joseph's new Egyptian name is all about, Zaphnath Panea, verse 45. It literally means God speaks and he lives. You notice how this name focuses on the God of Joseph and not Joseph himself. Now, perhaps we would think, well, maybe Pharaoh, just as a matter of personality, maybe he's just the passive, docile type. But we know that's not true. Recall, this is the Pharaoh who just threw two of his chief officials in prison while awaiting his decision of life or death simply for offending or disappointing him. So just as Joseph's actions cannot be explained any other way than that the true and living God is with him, so Pharaoh's response cannot be explained any other way then coming to fear the true and living God and ultimately coming to faith in the true and living God, the same thing we saw evidence of with Potiphar. 
Joseph will later tell his brothers that God has made him a father to Pharaoh. Genesis 45, verse 8. In other words, Pharaoh will continually look to Joseph for instruction in truth and wisdom and righteousness. He will look to him as a father. There will be many, many conversations between them. And Joseph's father, Jacob, will later bless Pharaoh, Genesis 47, verse 7. That's another miracle, for as the book of Hebrews tells us, the greater blesses the lesser, not the other way around. Hebrews 7, verse 7. By receiving the blessing from Jacob, Pharaoh is acknowledging Jacob as his spiritual superior. There is no way that happens apart from Pharaoh's conversion to the one true God, the God of Joseph. And now as we conclude this morning, I want to leave you with two things. And the first is what we already observed at the very beginning. What an amazing, vivid picture of Christ Joseph was. And you see God's love and his care in raising up these Christ types. But Joseph is the most vivid and detailed in all of Genesis. Such a clear picture of Christ, both in his humiliation and his, in his sufferings, and then also in his exaltation and in his wisdom. One of the things that we see through Joseph when he's exalted is the way that Jesus rules as king of kings. Joseph doesn't kick Pharaoh off his throne. And Jesus does not kick kings and rulers out of their positions per se. What Joseph does do is bring Pharaoh so that he rules according to God's word and will and wisdom. And that's the same thing that Jesus calls all rulers of the earth to do. He doesn't kick them off their throne and rule directly in their place. He calls them to be their disciples, which is exactly why the Great Commission to us is to make all nations his disciples. We also see how much care and trouble God uh, took to preach the gospel over and over, not only to his covenant people, but to the Gentile nations around. How many years did it take for God to set this up? To put on this play, as it were, showing forth the gospel message. And, and this is still just part of the setup for the gospel that God is going to preach through the Exodus. All of this time, all of this effort, all of this trouble to make sure the gospel message is going out. The second thing I would leave with you is noticing what a central feature of God's gospel presentation is showing people two things. Who's in control and who can save because it's none of us. It's nobody on this earth. Whether they are rich or poor, powerful or weak, regardless of their circumstances. As long as people believe whether they are great or small, as long as they believe that somehow they're in control and somehow that they can save themselves, yeah, perhaps they may need a helping hand from time to time. Everybody needs a helping hand. They're happy to have a God who comes along to give him a helping hand from time to time, but they don't need a Savior. Well, one of the things that God does in his providence is he shakes the earth. He shakes things up so that people come to say, I'm not in charge. I'm not in control. And I don't need a helping hand. I need a Savior. And I cannot save myself. That is central to God's way of bringing the gospel home to people because until people see that, they will never truly turn to God in faith. It is no one but the true and living God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent and exalted to his right hand with all authority in heaven and earth 
who rules this world and can save both from the storms of this life and final judgment. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Let us stand now and confess the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Christian, whom do you believe in? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Hades. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now present our thank offerings to the Lord as we sing the doxology. Come now to the Lord's table, where the Lord Jesus is both our chief cupbearer and our chief baker, bringing us wine and bread every single week. To signify one more time that we are his family, we are his children. And so he insists that we come and let him serve us. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we give you thanks for this bread and this wine by which you signify to us that we are your children and your love is upon us through Christ Jesus in the Spirit. We thank you in his name. Amen. Amen. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good.
Amen. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we give you thanks for the bread of life, the body of Christ that was given for us. And we thank you in his name. Amen. On the very night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat as often as you do as a memorial to me. The bread of life, let's eat it together with joy. For this reason, my brethren, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him the glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Our God and Father, we give you thanks for the blood of the new covenant, the blood of Jesus himself that takes away our sins. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Amen. Our Lord took the cup with the wine. He said, this is now the blood of the new covenant in my blood. And it's offered for the remission of sins. Drink it as often as you do as a memorial to me, for in this way you will show forth my death until I come. The blood of the new covenant, let's drink it together with gladness. I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you therefore, brethren, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the blessing of the Lord. <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We will love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. We will teach them diligently to our children, and shall talk of them when we sit in our homes, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, and when we rise up. And now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, and into the patience of Christ. And may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Amen. Amen.